Man, we are gonna get a lot of green. All right, so we are back out in the garden today. As you can tell, we got a lot of greens we're harvesting. These are just from two color green plants. And these things always do really well for us and it's really hard to keep up on fresh eating with these, especially because we have a bunch of other kinds of greens growing. So what we're doing today is we're gonna be canning greens. We're gonna do a huge mixture of everything that is ready to go in the garden. We're gonna do collards, beet greens, kales, and a few other different ones. So what I'm doing right now is I'm bringing the greens that are freshly cut into this ice cold water and I'm gonna leave them in here until we're ready to bring them up on the deck and get them canned. Okay, so we ended up getting a huge harvest and we barely even made a dent on the garden. We harvested kale, kohlrabi, beet greens, sorrel, collard greens, and we have some auric. Now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chop these up into smaller pieces, put them aside. We're gonna rinse them one more time before we start canning them. our first time canning greens we clearly have a lot and it's a good way to keep up with it otherwise just fresh eating is pretty hard we prefer to eat things year-round raw and fresh but we just don't have that option since we're here in Alaska at least not with our setup behind us so we are really excited to have these greens for soups or for you know stews or just meals in the winter yeah so this looks like it's a lot and it's gonna be a lot but we are going to be blanching this before we can it. So it's gonna shrink down yeah. quite a bit. Another green that would be really good to use for this is spinach and Swiss chard. We don't have spinach anymore at this time of the year and our Swiss chard did bolt very early, so we don't have that. But anything that's like a thicker green that will hold up well to blanching and canning, it does cook for quite a while. So you are losing some of that nutritional value. Um, lettuce, things like that are not really appropriate for canning. Okay, so we end up getting these two containers stuffed full so that's awesome the next step is i'm going to go up on our deck and i'm going to get a big pot of boiling water ready so we can blanch these and in the meantime ariel is going to give you an update on how the chickens are doing i that's my hair that's my hair yeah yeah do you want me to do that to your feathers yeah should i pluck your feathers is that how we treat each other? Okay. Don't do that! Don't do it! What are you doing? What are you doing back there? I don't want you back there. That hurts. That hurts. That hurts. That hurts. Don't bite. Don't bite. Ow! No. Okay, so we are out in the chicken run and goose run now. I was gonna give you guys a little rundown on how things are going. As of right now, we have 20 chickens and we have two geese. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the geese first. The geese are a little bit under four months old and they, I believe, are either female and female or we have a female and a male. It's our first experience with raising geese. Very happy with them so far. They are a cross of three different geese. So I'm not quite sure what their final look's gonna be. Hey, and Eric and I are trying to bring fresh greens in for the chickens and the geese. Generally the geese have a diet of grass, which we don't really have any. So we're just trying to make, make do with that for now. I don't know if you can see the chickens behind me, but we have 
16 Icelandic chickens. That's the land race that we got as chicks and we are really happy with those as well. We are we're interested in that variety of chicken for multiple reasons. They are more of a wild chicken. They're very alert. We've found all of that to be true so far. They are very difficult to catch and they do not eat as much food. They're better foragers. They also will actually hatch out their own eggs. They're very likely to go broody. So we do want a bigger flock in the future and we also want kind of a backup supply of chickens. Whether that be to sell, for food for us, for food for the dogs, we just want to have continual chickens coming in. I don't want to have to buy little baby chicks every year. So far things with them have been great. We have three roosters out of those 16 chickens. The rest are hens and they should be laying relatively soon in the next few weeks or so. There is a black chicken in the back. I don't know if you can see it. That's a Jersey Giant and we picked up five of those a while back with three ducks for free and we unfortunately only have four Jersey Giants now and we do not have the ducks. The ratio of ducks was one hen to two males, so that was not appropriate for us. So we have four of the Jersey Giants left, which is funny because they are the same size as our Icelandics, but they are only half the age. And that is what I'm attributing to our hawk attack because we haven't had hawk attacks in quite some time. And we did have one about a week and a half ago and it did kill one of the Jersey Giants. In the past, the hawks were not able to kill our Icelandics. They, Eric and I could come out here quick enough when it was happening and our Icelandics would get away and there just wasn't, there was more like a scuffle. So I'm hoping as everyone gets older in here, we're going to have less hawk attacks. Hopefully none, that would be nice. But I know there's always that risk when we put them outside and they're exposed to things like that. So that is what's going on in here. I am going to head back and we are going to check out how Eric's doing. Okay, so we got our water at a boil and we're gonna blanch these greens. Blanching is just submersing the greens or whatever you're blanching in the water and kind of wilting them. We're gonna do it for about three to four minutes and we're just gonna do a little bit at a time, maybe a huge handful. And I'm gonna stick it in this bowl and then we're gonna bring it inside and get it in jars. Okay, so the greens have blanched for four minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and remove these ones. So we're just gonna keep blanching these until I got this bowl pretty much overflowing. And then we'll hopefully get a whole batch. This thing holds 16 cans, so we wanna do at least 16 cans today. Okay, we ended up getting two bowls full from this one bin. We're gonna head inside and can these, but first I'm gonna empty out our blanching water and put some fresh water in there and get that boiling. Okay, we got our jars all cleaned and ready to go. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pack these greens in here as much as we can fit. We're gonna leave probably a little under an inch of headspace, and then we are gonna top them off with fresh boiling water get the lids on them and we're going to get them outside again inside the pressure canner. Okay, so this is turning out to fill a lot more cans than we thought, which is awesome because we're not going to have to... Okay, so this is actually turning out to give us a lot more cans than we thought, which is awesome. So next thing we're going to do is just top these off with some fresh boiling water. We're going to leave one inch headspace, then we're going to get them out in the pressure canner at 11 pounds for 70 minutes. Okay, what I'm doing now is just using a clean towel with a little bit of vinegar on it and we're going to wipe off the rim of the glass before we put our lids on. Okay our pressure canner will fit 16 of these if you double stack them. So that is what we're going to do and like I said before we're going to bring it up to 11 pounds and then these are going to go for 70 minutes.
Okay, so now we're on to our last batch of greens and we're gonna get these all blanched. Okay, the greens went for 70 minutes. We turned it off, waited till the pressure got down to zero. That's where we're at now. Let's take the lid off and see how they look. Okay, so these turned out really good. They look awesome. And I think we have about 25 more to go. I'm gonna start those and Ariel is gonna start on making some sauerkraut. Okay, so now that we are done with the canned greens, we were going to be making a batch of sauerkraut. I've already gathered the cabbages and when I was out here, I noticed that our daikon radishes are ready to be picked. This is a traditional ingredient in kimchi, which we've never made. And we're not actually gonna make that this year just because there are a few store-bought ingredients that I don't have and we don't feel like running to the store to pick up. But we are going to be pickling them, so I'm gonna pull a few out for today. Okay, so yeah, we're pretty proud of that. We have a few more going that are close to this size. We've never grown them this big again, so I'm very excited about that. They probably do get bigger, but that is a really lovely radish. So I picked another one, it's a little bit smaller, but it's still pretty exciting. Our mounds are only about maybe six or seven inches now that we've been watering. So it just shows that the plants are able to go down into the ground further than we anticipated because what we were starting with was pretty hard soil. So it looks like the manure and all that stuff we brought in is helping the soil that we are starting with and letting our plants grow deeper. All right, so we are back in the kitchen and we're making sauerkraut today. I'm also going to be adding kohlrabi and that daikon radish, but traditionally it is made with cabbage. Sauerkraut is super simple and straightforward to make. I'm gonna go over some of the processes today that help make it happen and the difference between that and pickling, but let's first start off by cutting up our cabbage. So I generally cut them in half and then go from there. And you can go ahead and cut out the white center. I usually get to that point and I'll cut that out. And what we're aiming for is smaller, thinner slices. That's also preference. So do whatever you feel works best for you. I just go for a pretty rough, thin slice. And go ahead and move to my bowl. And at this point, I can just cut out that white center. That's not usually that great to use in the sauerkraut. If you're looking to make sauerkraut for yourself at home, I would just recommend starting with one large cabbage head size. Again, green or red, doesn't matter. If you use both, just know that you're going to get red as the final product. It will turn the green red. But I just recommend doing one at first because you will get a larger amount than you think you'll get to like two quart size jars with that. So I always start with that. We know how much we want and I have five cabbage heads ready so that's why we're using that amount today. Okay, so a lot of us know what sauerkraut tastes like, right? It's got that tangy flavor to it, that crunch. I personally really love it. Eric loves it. Maybe you love it, maybe you don't. But I was just going to run down as to what is going on in that process. So again, sauerkraut is traditionally used with cabbage. And what you add is salt to the cabbage. And you can massage it or you don't have to. I generally do massage it and we'll go over that today. And what that salt is doing is it is going to pull out the juices or the water from the cabbage. And it is also creating an ideal environment for the bacteria that are responsible for producing your fermented product. So it is lactobacillus that actually uses sugars in the food that will convert that into lactic acid, which is what gives you that classic tangy taste of fermented foods. And it is also what is responsible for making a product that is safe to eat, meaning you won't get bad bacteria growth in there. So how does that compare to pickled foods or maybe sauerkraut that you will find in the store? Anytime you find sauerkraut that has been canned, and heated, it is basically voided of all its nutritional, I'm not gonna say all, it's voided of a lot of its nutritional benefit. It's voided of the true purpose of what sauerkraut is, which is to deliver those bacteria to your gut and really be helpful for you in that sense. So it's still a good product, it's just that it's not gonna have that benefit and that's because it's been heated up to such a high temperature that nothing can grow in there. So you've not only killed that bacteria, but you have also made it safe and shelf stable for a long time. That's the trade off there. And when you buy pickled foods in a jar at the store, it's basically the same concept. They use vinegar to make them shelf stable. 
So when you add vinegar to something like this, if we were to make pickled cabbage rather than fermented cabbage, we would not be allowing that bacteria to grow. That is what gives you that really awesome flavor and that gives you that benefit. So again, there is a trade-off. You may be wondering why would you ever heat up sauerkraut? Why would you can it? Why would you do that if you're gonna be getting rid of all the benefits? But it is because they are making a shelf stable product. So when this sauerkraut is done fermenting, we will actually need to put it in a refrigerator or in a refrigerator type setting. I'm just gonna keep getting these all chopped up and put away in our bowl and we will get back to it when we are adding our salt. I finished cutting up the cabbages and I forgot that I do need to get the kohlrabi and the daikon radish cut up. And I just wanted to show you guys, this little guy did get some bug damage. That's root maggot damage and it's not very bad. And if I cut in there, which I will, I may find one of the little grubs. This is, I don't think this is damage, but these are a bug that comes in when there's decaying material or the conditions are really rich and there's lots of moisture. I think they're called some sort of Springer, I can't quite remember, but they bounce and so I'm just gonna cut those out. So that does happen I mean you get you get spots that don't look pretty. I mean there are pests I'd say this is pretty minimal in my opinion. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut those spots out So that is one of those worms I was talking about and those little guys can totally wreak havoc on your garden, but I have to say they in our past they've really only They've really only gotten to a few of our plants and they've never really like killed an entire plant. I try to focus on healthy plants and healthy soil. That doesn't mean you won't get pests, you will still get some pests, but again, we just try to emphasize that and just cut those little bugs out if we find them. That's actually the first one I found all season. So I'm going to get this shredded now. We're gonna add this to the cabbage. Okay, we are onto the kohlrabi now and so it has this thick skin that we usually peel or cut off. I'll probably just cut it off today. If you've never tasted these, what the, the closest thing I can think they taste like is if you've ever tried like a broccoli stem, that crunch, maybe mixed with an apple texture, a little bit of sweetness. Uh, they really generally don't taste like much, but it's their texture I think that they are used for. And they're pretty fun to grow actually, especially if you do have issues with root maggots because root maggots tend to be in the soil and these grow just right above the soil. Now that we have everything all chopped up, I have the radish, the cabbage, and the kohlrabi in here and I've kind of mixed it thoroughly in there. We are going to add our salt and I use kosher salt. I like to follow the rule of at least one tablespoon per head of cabbage. That kind of varies depending upon the cabbage. These red cabbages, even though they were smaller, they were quite dense, so we do have a good amount of cabbage. If you don't put enough salt, it won't work properly, and you can actually get mold. If you put too much salt, then the process also won't take place. So just go off of that ratio, usually one to one and a half tablespoons per head of cabbage, and you'll usually get a pretty good turn out. So what I'm going to do now is let this sit and we will come back to it in about five minutes. I'm going to mix it through and what will happen is the salts will start to draw out some of that moisture out of that cabbage and get it breaking down so we have less work to do. All right, we're back and I let these sit for about 10 minutes or so and I'm gonna go ahead and massage them or work them. I don't know the correct terminology. I usually use my hands, but you can use a tool of some sort. And basically what you're doing is you are just massaging it down in order to get those juices out. And we need the juices or we need some sort of brine to put over the mixture. I had Eric step in. He was working on this pot and I was working on this one. They're shrinking down. We both added two more tablespoons to each one. A good indicator is also to taste the brine or taste the cabbage and kind of taste like pretty salty, kind of like sea salt. So not crazy, crazy salty, but also again, not just mild either. You really want to find that right balance. We are going to let these sit for another five to 10 minutes just to let those juices work out again, make our job a little bit easier. All right, so we combined both of the pots together and I continued to mash for another five minutes and we are at our done stage and I'm gonna show you how I know it's done. I know it's done because there's enough brine when I push down to cover the cabbage and that's what you're looking for. So 
Again, we've never had to make the brine. The cabbages themselves just let out enough juice. I don't know if you'll have an issue with that if you try this. If you do, you can add a saltwater brine to top it off. But I think if you squeeze long enough, you will get there. And what we like to do is put it in a container like this, um, a bowl or a pot, and then take one of the cabbage leaves and just put it on top and go ahead and push down until that liquid comes up over the cabbage leaf. And what that is doing is going to keep all of that cabbage underneath the brine. Anything that's exposed above the brine has a chance of molding and we don't want that. So what I do is usually every day I come over here and I check on it and I just push it down. And what I'm gonna do now, since it's all pushed down, is put a towel over it and I'm just gonna let it sit over in the corner of our kitchen. Our kitchen doesn't receive direct sunlight, so just keep it out of direct sunlight. You can even put it in a dark area and you want it to be anywhere from 60 to 70 degrees. It does take a few days for it to develop that flavor and some people like to let it go for a few weeks to get really tangy sauerkraut. We usually let it go for about five days, so that's what I'm gonna do and just check on it every day. We will get back to you when it is all done and we're ready to put it in jars. It has been five days that we have been letting our sauerkraut ferment. This is that leaf on top that we left. Now what I'm gonna do is two different things. We are going to be putting some aside and actually canning it. I know I discussed earlier that once you can it, you kind of destroy all those healthy benefits of it, but we do can it for one reason primarily, and that's because of long-term storage. So right now, this is our first year with that root cellar, and Eric and I are definitely not gonna get to all of the sauerkraut we've been making. So I'm gonna go over the instructions for both ways if you want to can it, or if you just want to put it aside and put it in a cool area and check on it and you're going to eat it soon, or if best case scenario, if you have a fridge, and it will store the best that way while maintaining all of that healthy bacteria in the sauerkraut. So we waited five days for this because that's the tanginess that we like. You can definitely let it go longer or you can even let it go shorter than that. So now that I have one of these quarts filled up, I am actually going to be putting liquid in there. So with the liquid covering the sauerkraut, it is now ready to be stored. You can put a cap on and you can go ahead and screw it on. And the one thing to know is that there is still a bacteria working away in here. So gases will form in there and you do need to burp it. And that is just going to depend on the temperature you keep it. If it's in the fridge, you're not going to need to do that at all. But down in a root cellar, you may need to open it up every once in a while or you do risk this jar actually exploding. Eric and I have never had that happen, thankfully. But if you don't wanna deal with that, or if you're not after sauerkraut for that healthy digestive benefit, then you can go ahead and can it like we do as well. So we can it too, like I mentioned, and this is the after product. And what I mean by can is we actually do put this in a water bath. Pints go for 20 minutes and quarts go for 25 minutes. So again, if you're just after it for the flavor or you don't have the right type of storage for it and you have abundance of cabbage, then go ahead and can it or water bath it. And you can enjoy sauerkraut all year long rather than having to try and focus on eating it quickly. So with this batch of sauerkraut, we're just gonna be keeping some fresh and the rest of it we are gonna be water bathing. We have too much coming out of the garden right now and we just need to put the rest of it away. So I'm gonna get back to packing these jars and we hope you guys enjoyed the video.